everyone. Uh, what Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hamid Gafour. Um, I lead the social housing team at BDO and welcome to the uh, webinar today, uh, which is on um, the new standard regime around consumer standards and uh, linking that in is around what uh, internal audit will be looking for. Caroline, next slide, please. So in terms of the agenda today, um, uh, it, it really is focusing in on on the, that piece around the consumer standards and setting the setting the scene around that. And Jonathan, uh, who I'm sure Jonathan Walters, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, Deputy Chief Executive at the Regulator of Social Housing, will will talk through uh, that elements. Um, and then what we'll do is focus in on actually how that will change the focus of internal audit. Clearly, a key focus for us um, this year in terms of plans as we move forward. Um, and if particularly that el regulatory element, um, and Rob Craven, who is a senior manager in risk advisory services, will talk will talk through that bit. Um, obviously, I'm sure there's many of you on the call today, uh, and you may well have questions. Um, there is an opportunity to um, set questions on. There's a there's a questions chat uh, on the uh, on on the screen on the on the Zoom screen, which you can set you can send questions through. Um, so and that's and um, what we'll look to do is at the end of the session, which just, the, the the presentation should take about an hour, and at the end of those presentations, you can um, uh, you, know, you know, just please send questions as you go along, and then we'll we'll work through some of the, with those questions as uh, at the end. Um, so that's it, really. So without without further ado, um, in terms of the the uh, presentation today, I'll pass you across to Jonathan. Thanks very much, Hamid, and uh, really good to be here. Thank you to BDO for organising this. It promises to be a really interesting session. I'm looking forward to the questions and answers later. So please don't don't hold back. Ask whatever question you wanted to know about regulation. I can't help you on anything that's not regulation. And I'm contrastingly not allowed to talk about anything to do with the election. I'm afraid I have to say that right up front. So. Um, Okay, if we can move on to the, the first slide, if that, that would be great. Thanks, Caroline. So I think we've got a mixture of both local authorities and housing associations on the call today. Uh, and this will feel probably slightly different, this new regime, depending on whether you are a local authority or a housing association, because for housing associations, this will very much feel like we're building out from the regime you've experienced over the last five to 10 years with the in-depth assessments and the stability checks and and the whole panoply of, of work that we currently do. If you're a local authority, I think this will this will feel very different. This will be the first time the housing services at local authorities have been subject to inspection since the Audit Commission and the TSA were abolished uh, back in 2010. So this really feels probably very different if you're sat in a local authority. So that, that may come out in some of the, the questions as well. But we've looked to build out from as I say, the approach we've already had, because it's worked successfully with housing associations and it's worked successfully actually with local authorities on a responsive um, basis. And that means we continue to focus on outcomes. So what we're not, and I think we would never want to be, is a regulator that's getting into, this is how you do repairs, this is how you deal with complaints, this is how you do whatever it might be. We're saying these are the outcomes you need to ensure you are delivering for your customers. But how that outcome is delivered will differ from organization to organization, from locality to locality, from client group to client group. There'll be a real mix of ways you might need to, to deliver those housing services, those outcomes that will depend on, on a whole range of things to do with geography and the, the people you're serving and so on. So we really want to keep that focus and keep away from getting it dragged into the detail. So I know one of the frustrations I think that some people have found with our new new approaches, they they basically want to be told, well, what's the ABC? How do I make sure that I pass the regulatory test? And I think our answer is, if that's the question, you're asking the wrong question, because the question is, should be, how are we delivering great services to our tenants? How are we, how are we ensuring that we're, we're behaving properly as a landlord? And you'll find that will be baked into all of our approach to regulation. So we'll be focusing on the outcomes, We'll be looking at you overall as a landlord. We are obviously interested in when things go wrong and how you respond to that and how you deal with it. But we continue to use this word co-regulatory because if we think at the heart of everything we do, that is really important. We think tenants will get a better outcome if the landlord is focused on meeting the tenants and where they are and trying to deal with the issues the tenants have rather than thinking about where the 
where the la where the regulator is and are we doing enough to keep the regulator happy that is really the wrong question the question is how do we ensure that we're delivering a good service to our to our tenants and because of that we're going to be very interested in what assurance you have as landlords that you are delivering the outcomes in the standards we're looking for the evidence that you have as board members or lead councillors or senior officers in the local authority or chief execs and c-suite people within the housing association what assurance have you got that the outcomes that are set in the standards are being delivered to your tenants and how do you know when things go wrong and how do you know that when things go wrong do you have mechanisms to spot them and put them right and really internal audit i think sits right at the heart of that of that nexus and i'm not just saying that because i'm on on the call if, if you go back and so on the call may remember this if you go back to what happened at the cosmopolitan housing association where um, they got themselves into very serious difficulty when we did our lessons learned exercise and when we got an external lessons learned in and they looked at that and they actually said a lot of the time the board was making the right decisions it was making the right calls but the internal controls framework in the organization was so poor that when they pulled the lever that said let's stop developing to preserve cash that message never got through to the development department who were merrily going out buying sites carrying on with the development because the, the internal controls framework simply did not work uh, and right at the heart of a lot of the work we've done over the last 10 years with housing associations has been focusing on what do, what do the internal controls framework look like what assurance are you getting from your three lines of defense and crucially what insurance are you getting from your from your internal audit uh, and we'll probably build out a little bit on that as we go through the the presentation but caroline if we can move on to the next slide please so i think some really really important things in here about what the new standards are. And I think some internal audit will be able to go into this in a bit more detail later. But I think really important things to say. One is these are new consumer standards, but consumer standards have existed and have already been in place for since 2010. So they've been in place for 14 years already. These are new and they are revised and they are hopefully brought up to date and they are hopefully really focused on the way the world is today. But the kind of eternal truth of what tenants want from their landlord are, decent repair service listened to when they've got a complaint, a responsive approach to their needs. Those things were baked into the last set of standards and they're baked into this set of standards because that really is what most tenants tell us. That's what they want from their standards framework. And I think really important for housing associations on the call is all the previous focus on governance and financial viability and value for money and rents actually for both local authorities and housing associations. None of that has gone away. So this is more not instead of this is not a watering down of our focus on governance and viability or on value for money this is an addition so you will find when we come and do an inspection if you're a housing association we're still really interested in what's your risk management framework what's your stress testing where is your asset and liabilities register do you understand the risks you're taking are you able to manage them etc 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 all of those questions will still happen but we'll also be very interested in and how are you hearing the tenant voice how do you ensure that you're spending enough on repairs and spending it in the right place? And actually, one of the strengths, I think, for housing associations for the new system is it allows us to look at the business in the round, not just the kind of the inputs of what money is being spent where, but also the outcomes and the outputs in terms of what is that money actually buying you? And given the significant increased spend on existing stock in the light of damp and mould and help, uh, building safety uh, and thinking forward to EPCC and Decent Homes 2, and net zero and the, the significant increase in focus on existing stock it is really important that housing associations are able to look at the quality of the services they're buying when they're investing in homes and looking at what they're actually finding when they spend that money and that's something we'll continue to be interested in so for us i think both economic and consumer regulation are all part of the same piece they're two sides of the same coin and the questions we'll be asking of the board will if you're a housing association will often be about both of those both of those things and i think in all of those again that assurance that the board has about is information we're receiving is it reliable is it valid is it appropriate one of the things we've discovered as we've been focusing on asset management over the last four or five years is the amount of confidence in the data tends to be higher the higher up the organization you go so if we if we go in and speak to board members and say how reliable is your stock condition information are you sure you're spending your money in the right place they will often tell us yes absolutely we've got an up-to-date stock condition survey and we, we we consider it each year what we're spending on our existing stock and it's it's all all in a great place as we work our way down the organization and as we talk to people at different levels 
the closer to the ground you get, the less confidence people have in the stock condition survey, the more you get told, well, it's a yeah, it's a stock condition survey from five years ago. It's been externally validated since, but it's been updated on a desktop basis. And you know, we don't actually know what's going on in individual properties because so much of our data is cloned. And I think, again, that speaks to, I think, at the board, having a really inquiring mind as to what information are we being presented, but also actively using things like internal audit to check that you are getting the right quality of data at the right piece. And the other thing I would say, which I'm, I'm sure BDO will come on to, so often it's important what question you're asking when you think about what assurance you're placing on whatever internal audit are saying to you. We as a regulator have over the years seen plenty of people who said, well, we've got an internal audit that gave us you know, substantial assurance. But when you look at actually what the scope of that internal audit report was, it wasn't actually, is your stock in good condition? It was a much more limited technical question. Uh, and yes, you had substantial assurance over that limited technical issue, but that, the board were then taking that as being actually substantial assurance about our whole asset management approach. And that, that wasn't what it was. So to anybody on, on the call, when you're commissioning or when you're de uh, designing your internal audit program and you're working through what the spec is, you need to be really sensitive really careful about the, the questions you're asking and how much assurance you can place on the report you're getting back from back from internal audit. Um, in terms of these standards, as I say, hopefully they do speak to the eternal kind of virtues about what you'd want from a good quality um, housing provider. So we are looking for safety and quality and that's where the government will put the new decent home standard when that comes into, into place. Obviously all of this has been made more complicated by the election we were i think we were expecting and hoping if it was an autumn election we'd have a consultation with decent home standard out shortly obviously all bets are now off until after the election and we'll need to see what the new incoming administration does of whatever color and where, where it wants to pick up where the current administration has left off and whether it carries on or whether it starts again so all of those questions i'm afraid are just adding to uncertainty in providers business plans i don't know when we're going to see a new decent homes standard but i'm sure that you know, stock quality in the social housing sector will continue to be important, whichever whichever political party gets into power. Uh, and while we wait for that new decent home standard, the existing one is in force and you need to be making sure that you are actually delivering against the existing decent homes standard. Um, when it comes to transparency, influence and accountability, this is very much about saying, how are you hearing the tenant voice? How are you ensuring that when you're making your strategic decisions, you're considering the needs of your customers? Are you ensuring that you're thinking about your customers in the round? Are you confident that you are delivering a good service to all your tenants, irrespective of, of their location, of their uh, demography? You know, are you are you making sure that you aren't inadvertently discriminating against any of your tenants? Are you making sure that you're making your services available appropriately to them? Are you listening when they raise questions and concerns with you? And are you responding in an appropriate way? Uh, neighbourhood and community, very much about are you working with your statutory partners? This isn't about saying your statutory partners can tell you what you have to do. If you're a housing association, you're an independent body governed by an independent board. That independence is really important. But it is important that you are working constructively and proactively with your statutory partners to deliver better outcomes for your, for your customers living in safe neighbourhoods. And finally, the tenancy standard. Um, probably the least focused on bit of the, the standards framework, but it's very much about ensuring that you are giving your tenants the appropriate tenancy, that you're giving them the most secure tenancy that you can and that you are helping them to maintain that tenancy uh, as far as as far as is possible. Um, so I think four standards that between them describe what you would expect from a good landlord. When we consulted on them in the summer, we were getting North Korean style levels of approval in terms of what the standards were saying. I think the overall averages were sort of in the high 80s. And when it came to the tenant respondents who were over half the people that responded to our consultation, it was in the mid 90s. So very much we feel this standards framework has got pretty universal buy in across the sector in terms of describing what's actually being delivered. The question now is what actually is happening on the ground. And that's what our inspection regime is going to, to look to find out. So, Carolyn, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so I'll come on and talk about the, the various tools we have shortly, but... Uh, and what, and maybe give you a little bit insight into what you might expect if you're having an inspection. And you might even have some people on the call who are currently subject to our inspections because we are out on site at about 30 odd organizations at the moment, both local authorities and housing associations in, in the first wave. 
So we will continue to use um, our inspections, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. We're obviously using the data we get from the TSMs. Um, hopefully you have all collected all of your data. Um, I'm afraid at least one organization has failed to do that, and they may be getting a regulatory notice at some point. Um, but hopefully most people who have collected the, their TSM data, they'll begin to start publishing that shortly. Uh, and we will be making that available in the autumn once everyone has submitted their data to us and we've, we've checked and cleaned the data. So that TSM data set will be there. It will be useful. Um, I think it will be more useful over time. I think in the first year, the TSMs will be a helpful can opener, but I don't think there'll be any more than that. And I think probably for the first couple of years, we're going to spend a lot of time angsting around data quality issues, uh, collection methodologies. Um, I've met many people who've told me they're doing it properly, but the people down the road aren't. And I think there is a real concern around the gaming of the TSM data. So that's something we'll be looking at really closely uh, in the first year or two. But I think by about year three, once we start getting some trend data and individual landlords can start seeing how their performance trends over time on the TSMs, that's when I think they'll actually become a really useful tool. Uh, and then finally, one of the things we're doing quite a lot already is responding to people either whistleblowing or self-referring themselves to us in terms of having looked at the new standards framework and decided actually they're not meeting that standards framework. Um, as a result, actually, our first regulatory judgments that will come out under the new regime won't be as a result of inspections, will be actually as a result of people having come to us and self-referred or a whistleblower where we've looked at the evidence and found that they're not actually meeting the consumer standards. So, so we you can expect to see some early judgments that aren't inspection related, and then some inspection related judgments will, I think, begin to appear um, probably after the general election now, but that's probably right in probably mid-July, mid to late July before you start seeing um, any actual inspection results appearing. Obviously, the whole point of this regime is to make sure that tenants are being listened to and heard, so tenants and the insight from tenants will feed into all of our, our judgments. And of course, we retain, in fact, we had an augmented series of powers given to us in, in the new legislation. So we will use those powers as and when we need to, to get landlords back to compliance. But that co-regulatory point about it is better for landlords to be delivering the outcomes required rather than the regulator getting involved, we hold really dear to that. So all of our interventions will be gradated um, and we will only be using our more sort of um, extreme powers in appointing board members, uh, fining, appointing managers, launching statutory inquiries, all of those sort of far end spectrum of the powers, they will, they are very much held in reserve. They are absolutely powers that we only use where we think the landlord is either unwilling or unable to address the issues we've identified. Where a landlord is, in our view, willing and able, they can be non-compliant, but we're if we're confident that they are actually able to, to put things right, then we'll probably take something like a voluntary undertaking from them and we'll work with them as they put, they get themselves back to compliance. But where we think they're unwilling or unable, then we will use those those wider range of tools. If you could move on to the next slide, please, Caroline. That's great. So the bit everyone is, is very excited about is the consumer judgments. What are they going to look like? How are they going to uh, feel? Uh, we've been really clear, I think, hopefully, if everyone has got this message, that C1 to 4, C1 does not mean everything is perfect in the garden. Um, and actually achieving a C1 is going to be quite difficult. If you look at the range and breadth of issues covered by the consumer standards, it's there is there's a, an awful lot in there. The sense that everybody is going to be getting all of that right all of the time, that's going to be really hard to achieve. So even if you're at a C1, we're not saying you're you're hitting all of the outcomes in the standards all the time, because that's going to be really difficult. Um, but I think our experience of doing the pilot project, this is, I think is beginning to be confirmed by some of our inspection work, is that actually a lot of organizations have still got quite a lot to do. So that a lot of people are going to be in that C2 space. One of the things we're finding um, I think already, and we definitely found during the sort of dozen pilot or a dozen or so pilot inspections we did, is we got a lot of jam tomorrow when it came to the consumer standards, very much a, yes, we really want to listen to our tenants, and yes, we're just reviewing all of our mechanisms to decide how we do it, but no, we're not really doing it as well as we should at the moment, with a sort of very caricaturish, broad brush sense of what we found and what we often find at the moment. So I think we will have an awful lot of organizations where you can see the, the willingness is there. 
and that if you've got a governance grade that will help with the governance grade if we can see the board are onto the issues that they're focused on and they're trying to address and that's all sign of good governance but the consumer grade is really saying well what is the experience of tenants today at the moment and if the experience of tenants today at the moment is actually complaints take ages to get processed it's very bureaucratic it's really hard for their voice to be heard if the stock is in not in great condition or more likely actually the landlord doesn't really know what condition the stock is in because it's, it's stock condition information is so far out of date. Um, those things are the sorts of things that are going to push you into the C2 space. And then C3 and C4, I think we're very much in the in the world of there is an awful lot to do here. It's going to be very difficult to put right. Um, and we're going to have to start working with you much more proactively. So I think if you've got a C2 judgment, We'll be interested in how you're putting things right, but you probably aren't going to have a, a great deal of contact from the regulator. If you're in C3, then you are very much in the space of working with us. We're probably going to be interested in what your voluntary undertaking is going to look like. Uh, we're going to be interested in, are you actually um, proactively putting things right? If you're in C4, then there are really very serious concerns. So we're probably looking here at things like you're not able to assure us on health and safety. You don't really have any clue as to what condition your sock is in, or you do have a clue and it's in a really poor condition. Um, your repair service is dysfunctional. Um, your complaint service is creaking and not, not dealing with complaints. Especially. All of those things are beginning to push you into C4. Now, obviously, if you're a housing association, you're getting a C judgment sat alongside a G judgment sat alongside a V judgment. So those three things in the round will tell you something about both what is the quality of the services to the tenants, what is the quality of the governance arrangements, putting those things right, and have you actually got the money to put those, to deal with those issues. I think I, I can see a world in which we're going to have a lot, an awful lot of organisations who are C2, V2, G1. We're going to have a lot of organisations who are, who are a mix of those things. If you're a Local authority, of course, you've only got the consumer grade because local authorities are democratically accountable. Um, we don't have oversight of the governance or the viability. And I think one of the interesting pieces in the new regulatory world is going to be local authorities saying, yes, we agree. We don't know what we should know about our stock or we agree that we're not delivering the outcome to our, our tenants, but actually we don't have the money to put things right. Um, that's going to be a difficult conversation we're going to have with a lot of local authorities because we don't have the oversight of the HRA or the overall local authority finances. And I think that is, um, that's going to be a, a clear source of, of um, regulatory interest. I mean, it's going to be a, a topic we discuss regularly, I think. But our view is the consumer standards are what it should, a reasonable landlord should be delivering. Um, and a lot of the things that we find are going wrong aren't really related to um, finance. A lot of them are related to culture and focus. You know, tenants are in local authorities are paying their rents just as housing association tenants are paying their rents. That money is meant to be going to providing a decent landlord service. And in our view, a decent landlord service includes making sure that all the gas checks are carried out on a timely basis, that the FRAs are responded to, that electrical safety is done appropriately, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot in there that is not really about significant capital costs, but is about are you really focused? Have you got the systems and processes? And again, that's another place that internal audit will play in very closely. Okay, Carolyn, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So um, our overall approach is is very much going to be about how do we drive that improvement in social housing? We we think, I think, from the, the evidence that we've seen on the pilot inspections, from what we've seen from our reactive consumer work, it really does think that there is, um, there is an issue that has to be dealt with. Social housing in this country is not in the place it should be in terms of the quality. The services to tenants are not where they should be in terms of the responsiveness. Now, there's a, a really important conversation that's above my pay grade about the reasons for that, about you know structural funding and you know decisions about rent levels and all of those sorts of things. So, absolutely, it's a legitimate discussion to be had about why are we why are we where we are. But I don't think that takes away from the fact that if you're a tenant in social housing, you are possibly not getting the service all the time that you should be getting. And what we want to do as part of our inspection process is and our regulatory process is to drive a greater focus on that and to deliver better outcomes for customers. And just as you, um, we would expect you to be taking your assurance, to be have plenty of QA and QC processes in place, we will be doing that around our judgments as well. Uh, particularly in the early days, we are, um, we are spending a lot of time making sure we calibrate these judgments. We know that when we put the first C2, C3s out, 
everyone's going to be interested in well, what does that say? What does that say for where the future judgments are going to look like? So we are spending a lot of time making sure that we are getting those judgments calibrated consistently uh, and fairly so that when you when we say you're a C2, you can look at other C2s and hopefully see those sorts of similarities. So there's a lot for us to do. We're, we're out there. We're hopefully beginning to, to put this in place. I think there is a lot for the sector to do, and I'm sure Rob's going to come on and talk about some of the challenges you're seeing in the internal audit space. But, but I think we will be, for both local authorities and housing associations, very interested in what are what is the assurance you're getting? How have you known that you are delivering those outcomes? Uh, and if you thought you were and you weren't, why didn't you know? Why weren't why weren't the questions being asked that would have revealed that those outcomes weren't being delivered? Um, and that is going to be a key part of our inspection, whether you're a local authority or a housing association. Is how do you know what you know? And if you don't, if you don't know, how are you going to find out? Rob, hopefully that sets you up for for where you're going to go next. I've not seen your slides, but um, look forward to questions later on if if that's helpful. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, next slide, please, Caroline. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to um, cover this in this session, I'm going to talk about the, the different um, standards in the consumer standards and, and then, and then un unpick um, the elements that are relevant to internal audit and thinking about how we can how we can uh, make sure that our, our, our audits focus on the, on the right areas, add value and, and ultimately provide assurance to, to those charged with governance um, that, we're, that we're, um, we're meeting the requirements and, and exceeding the requirements as well. Um, and clearly the, the impact of non-compliance with those requirements, as Jonathan said, you know, there's inspections, there's gradings, there's reputational risks that come with that. So, um, internal audit has has a key role. It has the eyes and ears of the organisation to make sure that you know we are meeting those requirements and and and, and exceeding and, and and meeting those demands. On this slide, I've just just pulled out some of the key before I drill into the key standards, uh, just some of the key messages really, and, and then thinking through some of the internal audit roles. So, um, I think I think. I think Within this this area, data is is, is key. Um, data and that means data governance. So, have we got the right policies and procedures in place? Do we have reporting and monitoring mechanisms? Do we have um, assurance over our data quality and integrity? I think what strikes me with with the consumer standards is the is is the broad areas that they cover. So, whether that's asset data, tenant data, performance data, and. Um, it, it covers the broad range of operations across the organisation. So, clearly, having having comfort over over data quality, you know, is, is fundamental to this. And um, the next part I want to talk about is tenant involvement as well. So, um, one of the things that strikes me with the standards is is it talks a lot about current and prospective tenants. So it's not just your current tenants on on the list. It's, it's actually thinking through. You know, our future tenants, our prospective tenants that we might be, um, you know, allocating properties to. Are we are we sure that we we're, we're handling those correctly? That we engage properly with 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 current and prospective tenants? Is there sufficient transparency in place? For me, that's key across across all of these standards. Um, record keeping. Um, a lot of this is around decision making as well, and making sure that we can evidence fairness and transparency, and and applying some of the key principles across these standards. So. You know, clearly providers need to have clear records in place. We need to show that we've made the right decision, how that's been challenged, how that's been reviewed and authorised. Have we got records across across um, different processes of what, what's been done to drive decision making and then reported to, to, to those charged with governance? Um, and, and there's a clear reporting framework in place across the organisation. For me, for me, records is, you know, having clear records and clear audit trails is, is, is clear to, to evidence compliance with these standards um, across the board, really. And, and I think, as, as Jonathan talked about, um, the, the consumer standards now needs to be a key part of scoping internal audits and making sure that we answer the right exam question for, for, the, for those charged with governance. So internal audits got a big role to play in terms of helping shape that. And it might be that um, audits might be shaped from a design, design angle, um, designing processes and controls to meet the requirements. And then um, as they embed and, and develop over time, then coming back and testing those at a later point as well to make sure they've embedded properly and, and delivered properly. But, but early on as well, internal audit can play a role in terms of validating and reviewing self-assessments as well, making sure the evidence is there to support self-assessments, making sure that if there are any gaps now that we can fill those gaps um, with some short-term um, actions and responses, and then actually helping them design and develop and embed those processes over time. So I do think, um, I echo what Jonathan said really about scoping and shaping audits and shaping the way internal audit works with the business is really important in meeting these requirements. 
Um, and then at the bottom there, I've listed around kind of recommendations and actions and improvements. Um, you know, internal audit has the role to deliver um, deliver findings, deliver recommendations, and, and they should shape improvements over time that will improve the, the maturity of a, of a provider in meeting the requirements. So I think internal audit can help on that journey, helping shape those actions, helping work with management to, 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 to agree what's, you know, what, what's, what's feasible and, and, and collaborating to make sure that the right um, actions are embedded into the business. And then clearly, if there are findings coming out of internal audit that, um, that mean there is potential non-compliance, then there might be a role for, for using internal audit reports in a way to help shape uh, self-reporting as well to the regulator. Um, and, and I know that, that transparency is really important in, in these standards as well. So, so clearly internal audit has, has a key role to play. Um, and, and over the next few slides, I'll just unpick, unpick further the, the different requirements of each standard and, and where I see um, some of the focus areas. Caroline, next slide, please. The first um, standard I've, I've unpicked is, is the safety and quality standard. Um, clearly, stock quality is, is is fundamental to this, and having a having a, an evidenced and accurate understanding of the condition of homes that, that our, our tenants live in, um, and this needs to be supported by, by a physical assessment with with decisions made around those homes, supported by the data that we hold. So clearly that, that links back to that data integrity point. You know, have we got comfort over the data that we hold about our stock? Do we under, understand our stock on a property by property basis? And when we're making decisions, you know, it could be around repairs, around health and safety. You know, are we using the data that we hold to make those decisions and can we evidence that? Um, for me, in, in, in relevant audits around this area, internal audit should be looking at the decisions made around stock and what's being done. And, and making sure that's clearly backed up by the data that's held uh, on file. And decency as well, um, meeting the definition of decent homes, um, having comfort around that definition, having comfort around the information that we hold to meet that definition is, is really important. Um, and, then, and then equally, what's held on file needs to re reflect what, what the work being done on the ground. So our stock condition records need to be up to date, needs to show that we're, we're meeting that required standard. And ultimately, there needs to be ownership around you know, how, how do we how do we get comfort that we're we're meeting the, the requirements of that definition and who's who's reviewing that who's signing that off who's authorizing that you know, you know it needs to be important that there's a there's a, a framework around that as well in terms of reviewing an overview of that of that health and safety is is, is key to this this standard um ultimately ensuring that the tenants are are safe in in the homes that they live in and that includes communal areas as well, and, and clear in, in this standard as well as around the completion of actions as well. So um, actions need to be completed on a timely basis. Um, there can no longer be a, a risk-based approach where it's kind of left and, 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 and held on file for a while before we, we remediate an action. Then actions need to be completed as soon as possible. And, and there needs to be clear evidence of that on file to show that you know, we're taking all the steps we can to, to, to make sure the tenant is safe in, in the property they live in. Um, and, and as well, that links back to um, some of the later standards around around working with other other partners and third parties. Um, ultimately, making sure that you know we're contributing to the community that the tenant lives in. We're making sure they're safe, that they're, they're where they shared spaces with other partners, that that's a safe environment, and that we're ultimately contributing to that through through those actions and through completing the work that we need to as a, as a provider of social housing. Um, repairs and maintenance has, has always kind of been there has been a key area of internal audit plans, um, and I think you know it still it still is a focus here. Um, and the key the key messages that I see in this standard are around effectiveness, efficiency, and timeliness, but also framing it from the customer's perspective as well. So, is the repairs process easy to follow? Is it is it simple? Can can the can the customer easily uh, report a repair? Can they easily track the progress of a repair? I think so. I, th I think with this area, it's probably about reshaping internal audits and making sure that you know we we understand processes from a customer perspective as well as the provider's perspective, and making sure that that is something that's easy to follow and the customer knows what's going on with the repair to to help contribute to to their property that they live in. And then finally, around adaptations as well. So um, clearly, adaptations need to be accessible for all tenants. There needs to be you know, equality of fairness in that and, and all tenants should have access to that service. Um, and then there needs to be active cooperation with local authorities as well in, in, in using an adaptation service. So again, I think it's when we look at internal audits of that area, it's making sure that, you know, can all tenants access this service? Can, can we demonstrate that? And how do we get assurance that 
we know that our tenants can access that service and in turn law, it needs to have a key role in, 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 in getting under the skin of that to make sure that's possible and, and, and make sure that that's visible. Um, and that links back to some of the later points around um, having access to services, engagement with tenants, access to information. It's clear that, that you know, that's key in, in the consumer standards and, and in turn law, it needs to make sure that the, the scope of our works covers covers that um, through, through, through the work that we do. Um, and then just thinking through um, additional considerations for internal audit, I, I mentioned earlier around decision making, transparency um, needs to be key. So there needs to be transparent decision making. Um, and then and then clearly um, the data integrity point comes through all these areas. And, and I see um, internal audit scopes across across this standard. You know, data needs to be coming coming through front and centre in, in the internal audit scopes of these areas because you know this is this is clear that the data integrity around stock quality, health and safety information, the information we've got to meet decent homes, the repair service that we have, and the adaptations um, information and data and access. You know, it's it's clear that data around that is fundamental to meeting this standard. So so I see that being being key um, as we as we as we shape our work in this area. Caroline, on to the next slide, please. Next standard to talk about is the transparency, influence, and accountability standard. Um, clearly, the, the key principles that come out of this standard are fairness and respect. Um, and it could be that uh, as internal audit professionals, in each audit that we do, we want to see that the, 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 those principles are coming through. And um, so if we are looking at a certain process, can we see that it's fair to, to, e to each tenant? Can we see that it's transparent? You know, are, are tenants treated with respect? So if, if a tenant's reporting an ASB concern or a complaint, do we do we respond with respect? Do we do we treat them um, in a fair and, and practical manner? And and, and are we uh, how are we also shaping our services um, appropriately? Uh, tenants um, there needs to be diverse needs considered in, in delivering services. So tenants need to be treated equitably as well, and we should be able to see that in in the work that we do as internal auditors. You know, an equal delivery of service to, to customers, and and that's really important in things things like repairs. Um, needs to be needs to be consistent, and and all tenants need to be treated equally. So we need to be able to see that and evidence that. And tenant engagement, I think, is a is a key one, and it's it's one that actually internal audit can have a more prominent role. I think in so, you know, can can we engage with tenants as part of our audits? Can we can we speak to them? Can we understand if they've helped contribute to a process or shaped a process? Where there's where there's tenant participation on governance um, forums or boards or committees, you know, is is that clearly embedded in the governance structures? Have they, have they helped shape services um, and 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 influence them? And 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 those contributions should be should be evidenced and should be visible, and we should be able to see those in in the orders that we do. So, I'd encourage that as part of our scopes, we consider how we uh, you know embed and incorporate the tenant angle in, into into the scopes of work that we do. And there needs to be clear provision of information to tenants around services um, and expectations, and um, within each audit area, we need to be seeing, you know, is is the information around this particular service is it visible? Is it reported? Can we see it clearly presented on 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 the website or in, in the annual report? Um, can customers have access to this information through policies procedures that are made available? You know, is it clear that tenants can tenants know what services to expect and and, and they understand? their role, the responsibilities of the landlord and, and their responsibility as a tenant as well. Um, and then and in complaints is in, is in the standard, which again, it's always been considered as part of the internal audit programme. But I think now it's, it's, it's around um, it's around that customer angle, you know, a complaints addressed proportionately. Um, can we see the effectiveness of a, of a complaint being dealt with? Have, they, have, they, have we responded promptly? Um, and is there a clear record and evidence on file to show the communication that we've had with the tenant throughout that period of complaint and um, it comes back to that record keeping point decision making point um, is there a clear audit trail for us as internal audit to see that those complaints have been addressed and handled appropriately and then finally around performance information um, it's clear that that's key to, to help support tenant scrutiny the tsms have been mentioned they're going to be key to to holding landlords to account um, and, and, and this support is supported by data quality as well. You know, have we got the right um, data on file to support the performance information that we're reporting? Can tenants easily scrutinize the performance? Is the information visible? Is it accessible? 
Um, there are, these are all key considerations for internal audit, making sure that that information is supported by a robust data and that we can we can trace back what's reported back to that underlying underlying data that's held on file. Um, so that so that is key, and and, and that comes through in, in each of these standards. Then finally, I, I mentioned earlier just around the self reporting protocol as well. You know, internal audit has a role in transparency. It has a role in bringing things to to the attention of those charged with governance. If there are considerations from internal audit where we think this is non-compliance or this doesn't meet the requirements, then then there needs to be consideration around how that's self-reported. And internal audit should challenge the the ownership of that process and you know who's taking ownership of self-reporting, who's making the decision, how are those decisions made, and whether, whether, whether something's material or not. You know, internal audit can have a role, it can be a sounding board to those decisions. And um, so I see I see internal audit partnering with the business in that in that process as well. On to the next slide, please, Caroline. So the next piece is around the neighbourhood and community standard. Um, clearly, the, the, the key aspiration of this standard is to drive a, a sense of community for the customer in, uh, you know, in, in the community, helping them work and contribute to you know, better social, environmental and wellbeing outcomes, you know, making valid contributions to the community that they live in and to help them be safe and, and to have a, a, you know, a, a positive life in the community. And the landlord has a key role. So if you look at the first, first area around shared spaces, um, there needs to be active cooperation to help maintain shared spaces. So this comes down to, to record keeping as well, making sure we understand where those shared spaces are. You know, can internal audit in, in, our, in our work in this area actively see those, those records? Do, do management know um, where the shared spaces are and who those third parties are to cooperate with? And how, how easy is that cooperation you know, being being performed um, and, and what improvements can be made? And clearly internal law can help support that and, and validate that and make sure that's in place. Um, there needs to be a demonstration of, of social, environmental and well-being outcomes being achieved. And, and those outcomes should be visible, um, should be challenged, and, and we should be able to see the contributions being made by the provider to those outcomes in, in the local area. And it's it's almost no longer a, a silo anymore. It's now around kind of working together with other parties, making sure the customer um, outcomes are achieved, and the cooperation. It should be you know it should be evidenced, um, and we should be able to see that that happens on a day to day basis. So if I if I was shaping a scope around this area, I'd want to make sure that that was part of it to make sure we could see the the cooperation with other parties. Antisocial behaviour um, comes down to case management. It comes down to the response to to ASB concerns, and um, it comes down to um, you know providing a suitable and timely response, and making sure that um, we're we're deterring ASB. We're 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 responding proportionally. We're working with other third parties to make sure that the right things are escalated and and passed on to other agencies. Um, and, and any third audit needs to make sure that, that ASB process is happening um, effectively and is designed appropriately to support that 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 that, that requirement. Um, you know, can we see cases being handled on time, being managed well, um, and, and and how have we responded to customers in that process, and have we engaged with customers as well? That 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 links here as well in terms of, you know, it's okay responding to a concern, but actually. Have we communicated well with the customer? Is that clearly demonstrated in the data that we hold? You know, internal audit should be challenging that process um, in, in, in audits of those areas. And, and the final bit in, in here was around domestic abuse. So um, this is almost a, 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 a kind of newly enshrined area in the standards. You can kind of bring this out in explicitly. Um, so this needs to be um, considered in the assurance framework now as well. What, what assurance do we have that that domestic abuse process is, is handled well? Are, are, are people trained? Do they understand what domestic abuse is, the signs and indicates domestic abuse? And then if, if we do spot signs of, of this, then how do we handle that? How do we report and, and escalate concerns? Who do we report to? Um, how do we communicate with customers? You know, for me, this, this area needs to be brought, brought into in, internal audits thinking um, because this this is you know, like I say explicit in the standards now. It's something that's really um, coming through in terms of you know being being a, a key part of a landlord's um, a landlord's responsibility to make sure we spot the signs because we are on the ground with tenants on a day to day basis. Um, so 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 this needs to be considered in the assurance framework um, for sure. Um, next slide, please, Caroline. 
And then um, the final uh, standard that I was going to touch upon is, is the tenancy standard, um, which is, comes through in the consumer standards, which, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this, this is all about fairness and transparency in, in allocating and lettings. So, um, you know, are we being fair in allocating our properties? Are decisions made appropriately? Um, and can, can, we, can we evidence why a decision has been made to allocate a certain property to a certain tenant? Do we have the records on file to show the, the decisions that have been made and, and the transparency of those decisions? And then also, if, you know, if we've not allocated a property to a tenant, then how have we helped them and supported them to find a tenancy? And, and what, what processes do we have in place to, to, you know, to, to support and help them um, you know, find an, an alternative uh, tenancy? Tenancy sustainment, um, you know, it's clear that throughout the whole life cycle of a tenancy, there needs to be a provision of um, of support and, and, and services to help sustain the tenancy. Uh, and there needs to be timely advice to tenants during the tenancy to help them, um, you know, keep the tenancy up. But then also at the end of the tenancy, you know, is it visible that tenants are supported and helped to find a new tenancy, help to find other options? And, you know, can, can, we, can we demonstrate that we're, we're doing that on a day-to-day -day basis? And I almost see in the internal audit consideration here around looking at specific tenancies, looking at the, the whole life cycle of a tenancy, you know, and can it be clearly demonstrated throughout that life cycle that we've done we've done this um, this well? So, um, you know, can we pick, pick a particular time period or, or or service, and can we show that we've 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 provided that advice to tenants, we've we've supported them, we've 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 communicated well with them. Um, you know, I see that I see that being a real focus here to make sure that sustainment is front and center of this of, of, of this uh, this process and making sure that we we meet this requirement. The tenancies need to be proportional to the accommodation and needs of individuals, um, so there needs to be a clear evidence as to why tenancies are proportional, um, why certain needs of individuals have been met in a certain way, um, and can we can we demonstrate that, that that's that's um, that's been performed properly and, and that we've got the right accommodation for the right tenant? Um, and for me, that comes down to record keeping. It comes down to the decisions that have been made, the audit trails that we have to show that we've got the data to make. To, to validate and make sure we're making the right decisions. So internal audit needs to be challenging those those decisions and, and, and almost getting under the skin of why that's been made and, and, and what are the needs of the tenant and, and can we demonstrate that we've we've thought about that. So if, if we're um reporting to the to the board, you know, we can show that we've got a clear process in place to 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 support, um, sustain and then also um, meet the needs of tenants throughout the whole tenancy. And then mutual exchanges as well. So they need to be fair and they need to be applicable to all tenants free of charge. So, so this comes down to accessibility of the service and it comes down to the, the protocols that we have to, to make sure that's available. And then it's for those who, who, who struggle with access, then, you know, it's available to those as well. And there needs to be clearly equality and, and fairness in that process. So it links back to the overall principles that some of the standards enshrine that we, you know, we need to make sure that comes through in the work that we do. Um, in terms of data here, I think I think tenancy agreements are key. So are tenancy agreements up to date? Do they reflect the needs and circumstances of tenants? Can we evidence tenancy agreements if, if, if asked for by internal audit to demonstrate why certain things have been done? Um, are there also protocols to support prevention of tenancy fraud as well? That's that's important in the standard. So um, you know, have we have, have we done the right kind of fraud risk assessment? Have we got the right controls in place? You know what are those controls, and, and how are we testing those on a regular basis through internal audits and making sure that the board has comfort that tenancy fraud is being mitigated and, and prevented. And um, so, so that's another key message that I think comes through in this standard. And again, it comes back to those clear procedures, clear controls, and, and that's a clear um, process for internal audits to think about as we're as we're developing our plans going forward. And um, and then and then. Um, the point around clear and accessible policies it also links to the appeals process as well so are we, are we sure the appeals process is working properly um are appeals handled correctly do we communicate well with tenants again that could be a consideration for internal audit in this area making sure that's handled well and and it's managed well by the by the business caroline next slide please so um i've just unpicked it a little bit further just around some of the considerations with regards to tenants and 
to look for in, in internal audits. So can we see that they've been involved in scrutiny? Can we see they've they've, they've handled and, and, and monitored performance um, and had receipt of timely and clear information? Um, and can we see that tenants have access to a range of effective and responsive complaint mechanisms? And they've got the ability to escalate those complaints if, if they don't feel like they've been handled properly. Um, how, are, we, are we clear that that's reported properly? There's clear information and policies on the website to, to, for customers to understand what a complaint is and how to make it. That needs to be clear that there's transparency around that process for customers. Um, homes need to be demonstrated as safe and fit for purpose for tenants. Uh, our records need to be up to date um, and proportionate to the needs of tenants. So we need to demonstrate that why, why a property is safe and why it's fit for purpose for that particular tenant. Requests for repairs and maintenance needs to be dealt with promptly and efficiently. So in repairs audits, we need to be thinking about that, thinking about how customers are impacted and what is their experience and how their satisfaction information is used to drive improvements to the process. Being supported with a range of services to help maintain the tenancy. So tenants need to be supported at all times and we need to demonstrate that level of support and the level, demonstrate the processes that we have to provide that support throughout the tenancy. And then tenants should have a good quality of life demonstrated through the, in the neighbourhood and the community and, and landlords need to be able to contribute to that. So those contributions should be should be rec recorded, evidenced, decision making and um, challenged and, and all that thought process needs to be captured in the information that we hold. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I think in terms of audit, should be thinking about the tenant perspective in, in all audits that we do. And that needs to come out really clearly. And that could be tenant feedback. It could be surveys. It could be interviews if we can. It could be discussing and, and observing tenant forums in, in governance structures, you know, that needs to be clear in, in the internal audit provision um, and help, you know, give the board comfort and assurance that, that the tenant perspective um, has been considered and, and they understand what that is and they understand the improvements that are, that are going to be made on the back of that. Caroline, next slide, please. And then I just... Finally, I want to just touch upon some of the kind of expected challenges based on experience working on internal audit in, in the sector. Um, I think data quality and integrity will be a challenge. I think making sure that systems are robust, making sure systems talk to each other, are reconciled um, and, and are up to date. Um, clearly, that takes responsibility, it takes ownership, and it takes um, clear processes to make sure that you know those those um, key systems are held, kept up to date, um, and it might and it comes back to data governance as well. So having the right governance protocols in place to support and um, improving data and, and 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 the policies around that data as well. So um, aspects for internal audit plan could cover data quality, uh, you know, integrity, and data governance as well. I think that's important to consider. Um, make sure those protocols are embedded from the top down. Uh, recording decisions made. I think it's all, always been a typical challenge, making sure those audit trails are robust, making sure that um, you know, we evidence why certain decisions have been made and making sure that we, we actually record them. Um, often some you know, decisions can be made informally, um, can be made in, you know, verbally in meetings, but actually recording them and, and evidencing them, in them um, is sometimes a challenge. So I do think that's something that you know, providers should look at and think about how we can, how we can better um, better record some of the key decisions across these standards. Tenant involvement and contribution again, it's 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 just around evidence in that and, and and documenting that and making sure it's clear as to how tenants are embedded in processes. So it might be that we, we you know we 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 look at the design of certain processes and controls and making sure that actually the tenant involvement is considered in those processes. An internal audit can help shape the design as well. So you know with, with the eyes and ears that we have, we can help. Make sure that we, you know, we shape the processes and controls in the right way to meet these requirements, so that then when they are embedded um, and, and developed over time, um, you know, those controls will be robust and, and, and operating effectively to, to meet the requirements. Because clearly, with the standards, for me, there's a, there's, a, there's a maturity piece here around kind of developing maturity over time, and having it to the Lord it has a key role in helping shape the processes and controls to be robust and fit for purpose for that maturity. And I think the cooperation with other third parties could be a challenge, um, and it might take a you know a bit of work. It might take, um, you know, developing partnerships, communication uh, protocols with third parties. Sometimes that might be a challenge. They might not want to engage, but it's about evidencing the the steps that we've taken as a landlord to 
to cooperate and to work with other third parties. Um, and if we can evidence the, the work we've done, the steps we've taken, then it's about being kind of cautious and prudent and, and, and making sure that we can evidence as much as possible to show that we've, we've taken steps to support the customer in the community. So that kind of cooperation is really important. And it's one that I think you know, providers will persevere with and develop over time. And then, and then bottom there is, is just around kind of what I've talked about earlier around kind of the, the kind of renewed focus on areas such as domestic abuse, where I would imagine boards don't have as much assurance as some of the other typical areas. And so it's around how do we assure that that area is well managed? How do we give comfort that people are trained and understand those requirements? And then how do we make sure that's reported properly and appropriately um, through the assurance framework? So I, yeah, I, I think as part of unpicking these standards, you know, there are some areas that you know, have been, have been in internal audit plans for, for years. There's some areas that probably haven't featured as heavily. And I think it's, it's now around kind of how do we make sure that they're covered off through the assurance framework, whether that's internal audit or, or second line functions. And um, it's about, you know, making sure that that, that that assurance framework is there and it's operating well to provide assurance in the right areas. Thanks, Caroline. I think that's that's comes to the end of my um my slot. And I think we've left quite a bit of time for QA at the end. Um happy to take any questions on the internal audit side of things. And I'm sure Hamid and Jonathan as well will be able to take any questions as well. Thank you. Okay, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Jonathan. Really, really interesting. Lots lots of change. And I suppose one of the, the key themes around this is that it's it's quite a it's not just a new standard. It's 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a effectively it's quite a, a cultural transformational cultural change really in terms of what organisations need to do um, and the way they need to think uh, and and their focus um, around around this area. So uh, certainly something that's um, you know going to as I think Jonathan said going to continue to evolve um, um, and um, best practice will call come out from that. But there's certainly some good good tips there in terms of what we need to what we as a sector need to be looking at. So in terms of questions, I've got I've got um a couple of questions I've come through. Um so I will direct these as either Jonathan uh, or um Rob. Um so first question, it's pretty uh, short one and it's for Jonathan. Um so Jonathan just in terms of the uh, the grades the C1 to C4 and and probably the regulatory framework well the, do you have a threshold in terms of um, size of register provider in terms of what you look at? Does this apply to all register providers? Yeah, no, so it's a really good question. So the framework applies to everybody. So the standards, whether you're a one unit arms house or whether you're a hundred thousand G15 member, the, the standards apply to all all social landlords. The inspection processes and the kind of enhanced data requirements around financial data, the cutoff point of a thousand homes under management is is still the cutoff point. So if you have more than a thousand homes, you will be inspected. If you have less than a thousand homes, you will be expected to supply or expected to um, be collecting TSM data. You'll be expected to be complying with the standards. Clearly, it's going to look very different if you're a very small organisation. You know, one staff by volunteer, that's going to look and feel quite different. Um, we will only be following up where we're getting referrals. So where. Um, where people are coming to us with issues or where things are brought to our attention and we will carry out responsive engagement with organizations so you will see organizations with less than a thousand homes getting regulatory judgments but that will be back off, off the back of responsive work rather than um proactive inspections yeah great thank, thank you jonathan um next question is a bit of a longer one and again it's for jonathan so jonathan did the question is a TIA standard has a key focus on making sure all residents can access information about all landlord services at all times, which is likely to result in residents being presented with a huge amount of information at any one time via a variety of different channels. If an organization can demonstrate a strategic approach to targeting the right information at the right time to the right to the right tenant, the right person, would this is that is that your expectation in terms of the requirements from that, or is this something else? Hope that no, makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, goodness, most tenants probably just don't ever think about their landlord, do they? So they don't want to be constantly bombarded with information. It's about making sure tenants can, act, when the tenant needs to access the information, they can access it in a way that works for them, whether that's via the website or whether it's you know 
running a call center or whatever it might be. So it's it's up to you to work out what is the best way given your your tenant group. And do you need to provide it in a variety of different languages or different formats? Or all but but this is about making sure when the tenant wants to access the information, they can do it, not not sending out flyers every every month with a whole range of stuff that probably no one's ever going to want to read. So yeah, absolutely the strategic approach is the right one. Okay, cool. Um again, another question for Jonathan. Um so if this is around the grading, um so if a C one grade doesn't mean that all requirements are met at all times. What would be the difference in experience for residents between their landlord being a C1 and being a C a C2? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, if you look at what's, if you think about the way our gradings work, we have two gradings for one standard. The governance and viability cover just one standard. Then we've got one grading for four standards. Um, and we did we you know we did look at should we have different gradings for different standards and so on, but. I think basically tenants want a simple way of knowing is my landlord doing a reasonable job, and that's what the the C judgment is gonna is gonna give an indication of. Um, I think you mentioned the word journey, Hamid. I think that's absolutely right. Um, this is going to be a long term journey for all the things that Rob was unpacking around data. The sector is not where it needs to be right now. It's going to take a while to get there. I think if you're a, a C one landlord you are probably already doing a lot of the things we would expect to see. You'll have good quality data. You will know what the position of your stock is. You'll be listening to your tenants. That's not to say that every one of your homes is going to meet a decent home standard at all times, because there are reasons why they won't at various times. It's not that you won't have got some complaints wrong, because you will, because just stuff just goes wrong. So this is not a C1. It's not a guarantee of you know, no failure ever. But a C2 is saying there are clearly there are some structural things that need to be sorted out within this organization maybe it's to do with stock quality maybe it's to do with the complaint service whatever it might be but you know what i mean it, there'll be a very specific thing you can point out and say this is not really working in this landlord i see one is saying broadly it looks like everything's working fine excepting you know that stuff happens and stuff does go wrong sometimes but, but i suppose jonathan just to, just adding to that your your approach to this has to I mean, if you're reviewing a fifty thousand unit organization, you, 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 doesn't, your approach has to be a strategic approach, doesn't it? In terms of the review of data and what what that organization is doing, and the, and the, and you 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 won't be able. To, it doesn't make any sense for you to go into the a level at that a really level of detail, does it? Am I well, right? Well, completely, absolutely. Yeah, we are not going to be getting into have you handled this particular complaint, right or wrong. Do you know exactly what you need to know about that property? Working at the systems and the processes, are those in place? If they're not in place, are they being put in place? Those are the sorts of questions that we're we're asking. And then as Rob was saying, testing, do the board actually know? Or what do the board know? And, and what level of assurance can the board place or the councillors place in the assurance that they're being given by by their management teams? Okay, great. Uh, Rob, you're delighted to know you've got a question for you. Um, to, to what extent and how should internal order engage with tenants? Either in shaping the audit plan or in gaining assurance. I think you touched upon this in your in your in your presentation, but just to elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, so, so I think I think in terms of the plan, I think there's a piece where you know if you've got tenant panels or scrutiny panels, there might be com conversations to, to be had around around the focus, and if there's any areas there that could be brought out. Um, and then in in terms of in terms of providing assurance, um, I've seen examples where there's been tenant focus groups um, held. Or certain um, interviews with with nominated uh, tenants, or also using using tenant survey data as well. I think often um, providers collect a lot of tenant data through surveys and through feedback. You know, can internal audit get get under the skin of that? Understand what feedback's been collected, and then use the results of that to shape to shape the assurance that's then provided. So, I think there's a piece around kind of direct, um, you know, communication with tenants where possible. Um, but then also using the information that is, that's, that's obtained directly from tenants to to help shape what's reported. Great, thanks, 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 Rob. Um, getting back to Jonathan, um, Jonathan, I think you touched upon this any in your bit anyway. So I think it's a quick, quick one probably. But what's the latest on the competency and conduct standard direction? Um, and will this be paused until after? I think you said it would be paused after the election, didn't you? That's right. Yeah, competency and conduct, AWAB's law. Um, stairs. All of those are basically on hold till after the election, and new ministers decide what they want to do. So yeah, we're in a holding pattern. Okay. Uh, admin question, which I'll take into the slides. Yes, slides will be sent out um, after after this. No, no issue with that at all. Um, right. Another question. Another question for Jonathan. Um, 
Given the level of detail and process included in the RSH, RSH consumer standards and the level of North Korean adherence in the sector, is there now a risk that housing associations and their debt will be considered as public rather than private entities? No, we were really careful about that. Um, and you know the, the North Korean levels are very much you know, people are proving this looks like this looks like what a, a good landlord service should look like. I, I mean, honestly, if you look at what's in these standards compared to what used to exist under the Aud Audit Commission or the Housing Corporation, these are a million miles away, and they are very much about overall. Um, you know, what are the outcomes that are being delivered? They are really not getting into this is how you this is how you should run your business. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you're HA for-profit landlord you're an independent organization you've got to make the right decisions for you as an organization cool okay thank you um and i have a final question on the list here is and i suppose again this probably evolved with 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 um process and it's probably dependent but how i mean how long will a c3 stroke c4 landlord uh, get to fix the issues and what happens if they don't yeah it's a really it's a really it's a really good question. I mean, I think if people know we, we have a willing and able test, is the landlord willing to put things right and is it able to? Now, clearly, if you're willing to and you're able to, then then that should be a relatively light touch. We often find, well, and that's a normal combination with most of the sector. To be honest, most of the people in the sector, want they want to do a good job. They want to put things right. So if we find things are wrong, they will try and put things right where we've identified there is an issue. Sometimes you have landlords who are not willing, and that's where we end. We often tend to start using some of our more really formal powers, intervention powers. Sometimes they need a bit of help, sometimes they need a bit of strengthening. So you'll you'll find appointments to boards. There are things like that where, where they just need a bit more capacity to enable them to to sort things out. I think one of the questions and forefront of our minds at the moment is, is for example, local authorities where the HRA is under pressure, overall local authority finances are under pressure. Um, and actually, the stock might need significant reinvestment to get it to the place it needs to be to meet to meet the decent home standard. In those sorts of situations, I think that's going to be an interesting conversation with us and the local authority, and possibly you know, involving involving wider central government about well, how what what happens if local authorities are struggling financially to put things right. But I think, as always, as we would always say, they need to be really honest with themselves about you know. Are they doing the most they can to help themselves? Are they putting the rents up, you know, as much as they can do to generate sources? Are they being as efficient as they can be? You know, there are questions that people need to be able to answer, but we will have to see as time evolves. Are, are we in a position where we have people who really want to, but just simply can't afford to? And then what? What's the policy response to that? I think. Okay. Um, actually, another question came in as you were talking. Um... Um, and again, I suppose this will again will evolve as we as as we go along. Um, the question is: There are concerns from some colleagues that having appeals processes in place could have the potential of adding a stage to the complaints process. Are there any thoughts on this, please? Um, I mean, I think you want your complaints process to be as fair and transparent as possible, and um, I think an internal appeals process will often be better than having the than things going elsewhere, whether that's the court or onto the ombudsman. If you can resolve it internally, then that's a better result for everybody. But I mean, clearly, there's a question about the culture you have within your organisation to complaints, and you know, do you and how you respond to them. It, it is not; it's not an easy world. Like, you know, we things that we see, the things that come to us, these are often really difficult, really complex cases where there isn't a simple right answer, uh, and it's not always completely obvious that the landlord has done something wrong. So it's. This is difficult, but the more you can do to demonstrate that you've taken the, the complaint seriously and try to address it where you can, I think that's that's the better and that, that's what we're trying to aim for. Brilliant. Okay. Um, just checking. I don't think there's any more questions. Um, so I think we can, we can, we can wrap this up. So um, just want to say, uh, firstly, um, thank you very much to uh, both Jonathan and Rob for uh, the pre presentations today have been extremely useful uh, and it was interesting actually in terms of uh, when Rob was talking how that was linking into what Jonathan talked about in terms of his his areas as well um, 
but oh, clearly this is an area that will continue to to evolve. It's it's pretty new, um. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next twelve months, and and obviously with the level of change going on with the election as well. I think from a sector perspective overall, there's going to be some some interesting things happening in the next in the next twelve months. So I think that effectively ends this session. We will send uh, a communication out with the slides following uh, this, se this session, but I think that is it. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, and um, yeah, take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hamish.